and we're in hello everyone and welcome to the third live stream climate action event this has been a crazy technical setup but we're here and that's the main thing we are live broadcasting from many different places around the world so uh for those who have managed to track down the various links to find out where we are congratulations like uh, a treasure those trail. people who will be watching us later on uh great well done for tracking us down as well. Uh, we've we are twenty minutes late, but we hope the enthusiasm uh, is still there because this is really important. What we're doing, we're trying to get people together to to save the world, to to have impact, and uh, we have three amazing uh, speakers uh, today. So very quickly, I'm going to introduce them. Um, we have first of all Loic. Um, would you like to wave so everyone can see your face? Hey. Uh, Loic is uh, the first pilot to succeed in the Arctic World Tour uh, aboard a prototype light aircraft with cosmonaut, cosmonaut Valery uh, Tokarev. Uh, we also have Kat. Would you like to say to wave? Kat? Hey, everybody. Uh, and Kat, is, uh, she has an amazing TEDx talk that you can watch. We'll send out this link soon. Uh, she's an award-winning and tireless waste prevention activist, uh, researcher, and practitioner. So uh, she, is, she has many other organizations that she's part of, which is reducing waste. So uh, we'll hear more about that in a minute. And uh, the third speaker, Sean, uh, is not currently present, as, you, as the eagle-eyed <laughs> viewers of you might have seen. Uh, Sean will hopefully uh, join us soon. He's on a barge. He's been living th for three years off-grid. So uh, we look forward to hearing from him as soon as he sorts out the technical issues, <laughs> uh, which has been many. Okay, so we're gonna jump in as, as just to introduce the other two, Tom and Luke. Uh, they're the other hosts with me tonight. Luke is gonna focus on uh, solving all the tech issues. And Tom in is- In uh, today. Is, <laughs> in an breeze. And Tom is gonna chip in with some questions uh, at the same time and and all those out there right now if you've got any questions please write it in to the side in the in the chat uh, on this on the right and we'll uh, we'll ask it uh, for you okay super so um, Loic, I'm gonna start with you oh. would you like to say hello give a kind of a, a brief summary about you and your mission and and what you've been working on well uh, okay let's keep it short uh, hi everybody i'm very so very happy to be here uh tonight and i think international co cooperation on um, ecological matters is just essential because this is just one world one planet and the all the problems we are facing right now will not be solved by one individual or one country and we really need to work together so i'm very happy to be uh, here uh, so as you said i'm a pilot uh, i've been touring the arctic circle uh, for 45 days this summer not for the not for sports but because i i do have a multiple sclerosis and what i leave in my body is the exactly exact same thing as what is happening to the arctic meaning that every day we are not acting acting or developing a solution we lose something and we will never see it back in the history of humankind anymore and uh so i did that and i'm trying to to incent people to to react and to, to prove that as long as you do not uh, give up, nothing is lost. <laughs> Sorry for my English. Uh, I'm flying is my life, but I've uh, I stopped flying now because it's not possible from my point of view to, to keep on using planes with uh, fossil fuel. Uh, uh, and it's very difficult for me not to be flying because uh, it's an e essential point of uh, what I am. So I'm developing a nitrogen pro uh, aircraft. Um, oh. I'm sorry, it's very difficult for me in English tonight. I'm quite tired. Okay, 
but uh, because I think hydrogen is one of the solutions that we we need to put on the table right now because it's making possible to have uh, to create an internet of energies and to have energies flowing all over Earth. Uh, hydrogen can provide that that kind of solutions, and uh, this is maybe not really clear what I'm saying right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah. That, that's what I'm working on. This is, is, is this a hydrogen plane? Yeah, it is. Actually, it's an electric plane with a fuel cell uh, that's using uh, hydrogen as fuel. So it's 100, as long as you produce hydrogen with renewable, renewable how do you say that? Uh, with, with wind and sun and hydraulic power, then you have a 100% 100, 100 clear uh, green hydrogen and uh yeah but i mean th there is more to it we are trying to build a plane that is uh all produced with recycled uh uh components and trying to have the to limit as much the the impact uh on the environment of that plane and uh yeah and right. should we get, move around and sure. get a bit of mobile <laughs> cool all right well i i think kat you you are next um so would you like to give a brief summary about uh you know your your mission so far and how, how it's going sure sure so i'm kind of located um down near brighton on the south coast of england about I don't know, 50, 60 miles from London, and uh, I'm from Australia, but I've lived here for about 26 years, and uh, I guess my, my mission is to try and prevent waste, and, uh, you know, it's uh, em embroiled with our really broken economic system, which is a linear economy, and the basis of capitalism involves us... Uh, taking resources from planet Earth, turning them into objects and materials that human beings then consume. And then the linear model is just about discarding that stuff and it becomes waste. And then you have to manage that waste. And really what's happened over my lifetime is we've gone from that system uh, not really throwing up any... Uh, uh, big alarm bells, if you like, to it throwing up the biggest alarm bells of our time where there are 7 billion people on the planet now and only around 2.5 billion of us are actually in the consumer class where we're, we have enough economic um, viability that we can consume more than shelter, clothing and food and so we buy all this stuff in our life. And really there's just way too much stuff in the world and capitalism dictates that we must endlessly, endlessly consume stuff. And so corporations and producers and manufacturers have instilled obsolescence into just about every product made for consumption. And where they haven't put obsolescence, built obsolescence into a product, they've made a product disposable and only single use. And so the reality now that we're all facing is that we're drowning in stuff and in waste. So the kind of things that I've done for a number of years to try and uh, raise awareness around this issue and to encourage people to stop shopping, stop shopping, is um, I'm one of the founders of Freegal, which is an online reuse network, has around 2.7 million registered users in the UK. It's just a very simple online platform where it just enables people to be able to pass on their unwanted stuff so it can be reused and not end up in landfill or incineration. Um, that keeps like a, uh, around 500 tonnes of stuff in circulation every month in the UK. And then I've done other projects down uh, kind of real life rather than online projects down here in Brighton um, to highlight waste issues and to prevent waste. So probably the most famous is the Brighton Waste House, which has been open for about five years. It's an architect designed building made from 90% waste and I sourced all that waste. 
Um, and then I do a whole other bunch of stuff, take, take back pop-up shops. Um, do, uh, I work with the city council as a reuse manager so they no longer get skips or employ clearance companies. They employ me to give away all their unwanted assets. So, yeah, I just kind of try to put my ideology actually into practice and provide real-life solutions for just ordinary people to not be so wasteful. So, yeah, that, that's – I'm just a citizen, though, you know, um, and, and I'm probably just a great example of how any little thing that you do actually does matter and that contributes to a collective uh, – shift and change that we all need to adopt and you know we don't need to be a corporation or a massive campaign or or you know everybody can do something to address the problems that are facing us wow thank you lovely cat all right uh, should we say a little bit about ourselves as well to kind of yeah, us three? Sure. yeah. um I'll just do like 30 seconds. So um, I also like Kat live in uh, Brighton. Um, Kat and I know each other uh, quite well. And um, I'm a filmmaker. I'm also working on a social enterprise here. A lot of my films are for organizations that are working in this field of, um, yeah, trying to develop community, regenerate uh, biodiversity, um, and yeah, respond to climate change, bring communities closer together. So, um, yeah, just also, I guess, for anyone who's just joined, I'm just seeing that there's there's people who've somehow managed to make it to our <laughs> live stream. Well done for, for getting this far, you troopers. Um, if you missed the beginning, it'll also be recorded so you can watch back. Um, and so just to kind of briefly reintroduce, um, which is something I think we should do one or two more times through the call for people who join halfway through, um, we're exploring a really important question, which is, what can we each individually do to be part of the solution responding to uh, the sixth mass extinction um, or certainly um, you know, exponentially increasing biodiversity loss, biodiversity upon which we as a species depend upon um, and responding to climate change. Um, and yeah, the, the negative impact that we're having in the world, how can we be more of a positive impact uh, environmentally? Um, so that's why we have these wonderful people, if you've missed the beginning. Um, and that is enough about me, I think. I'll pass on to you chaps to continue. Uh, you're muted. So we've got Sam and Tom who are about to just introduce themselves. And it's the three of us who started these climate action live streams. Yeah, there we go. So um, oh, thanks, Tom. Luke. Um, I uh, wanted to get this project off the ground because I've spent um, a number of years as an activist and going to protests and actions and I felt like uh, I was getting quite bogged down in, in reading various books and I, I wanted my information to come from people that were really experienced and um, face to face um, and I think that we're living in a certain time where getting real information from people that are knowledgeable and have the experience is really important so I wanted to branch out and make uh, connections with um, people like our guests today and um, and hear what they have to say and I, I want to do things and so that that really is the the core of these live streams to inspire action so when we speak today I'll remind our speakers that we're really talking to people what can they do what can they come away from the talks um, from the talk today and actually put into action Super. Okay, and yeah, just very quickly, I've, I've created a project called 8 Billion Minds, which is to do with worldwide learning. Okay, so I think that right now is a good time to introduce Sean. Sean is on a barge. Does your microphone work? Does it? Is it oh, working? It does. Super. Yeah. <laughs> well done, right. Sean. Great that you've yeah. made it. Um, so what we've done now is, is we've, uh, we've uh, both Kat and Loic has basically just given a summary of uh, the stage of their life, their story, and the current mission. If you would, if you wouldn't mind to do that, and then afterwards we'll we'll accept questions from the audience, and we've got a few from, sure. of ourselves. Uh, I'm I sort of come from it from a more of a, a negative viewpoint. Um, there's there's a lot of social media, and people feel they have to do something. And for instance, if you take Fukushima there's 
there's basically zero dead people. And Japan, because they had to do something, closed their nuclear plants and started burning coal. And that is equivalent. That, that just kills millions of people every year around the world. Uh, and then the German Green Movement felt they had to do something about their nuclear reactors and they closed their nuclear reactors. And now Germany makes five times as much CO2 per megawatt as France. And that's because of the Green Movement getting involved in energy policy. So my whole point is basically the Green Movement sort of is almost responsible for the catastrophe we face now. And that that's basically my premise. Controversial. <laughs> no. And and feel free to 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 discuss anyone. I'm not going to hold back on this. <laughs> well, I know George Monbiot agrees with you. You know, and I know he takes a lot of flack on social media and via the Guardian for you know suggesting that nuclear is the solution. So you're you're not alone. And I, I'm kind of it's a really difficult issue for me because I'm a real waste person and the biggest issue really around nuclear is the waste that, that that's created and where does that go and what do we do with it? And if you're Australian like me, then you're aware that there are bonkers things going on like they're just burying it in the desert in the middle of Australia and yeah, but, but you don't even understand the implications of that. I, I mean, I don't know the answer. I think when you when you bring up Australia and then you look at Australian energy policy and the way it just burns coal yeah, well, and it, it produces 700 it's Australia is is worth about the worst country in the whole world absolutely I agree with you. it's shameful what and, they do and if they yeah and and the millions of people dying and it's what it is with with this is it's nuclear is localized pollution Right, so people opt out of localized nuclear pollution and just pump carbon dioxide and and coal dust. And coal is radioactive anyway. Right, and it, it's it's the ability to dilute your poison around the world, rather than thinking, okay, we're responsible for our energy. Let's deal with our nuclear waste where it happens. And instead, it's burning coal or gas. And this this is due to the Green Party and the Greens equating nuclear with nuclear bombs and just you know everyone's there at green and common and it i think it's I think, a hangover from the 60s i think a lot of greens though well really they're just in favor of renewable energy and that's where they that's what they want to focus on but, but renewable renewable energy makes no difference at all to co2 output the thing that makes a difference to co2 output is nuclear and hydro Solar panels and wind turbines are backed up by something. And Germany is like 50% renewable and is, is, makes more CO2 than any other country in Europe apart from Poland. Yeah, and in Poland, you and that, choke on the coal dust if you walk around the streets. I mean, it's frightening. When right. I got off the train in Poland, I mean, you just inhaled coal. It was phenomenal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. like outrageous. And and, and this, this is this, so this argument that renewables, there is no correlation between, if you look at a country's amount of renewables and the CO2 output, there is no correlation at all. The correlation is between nuclear power and CO2, but nothing else. I think else. this issue is what makes it really awkward for people who want to do the right thing. So they hear you saying that about nuclear and that that's the answer, and then they hear a whole bunch of green people saying right. nuclear isn't the answer, and I think that, um, you know, that's a fine debate to have, and I'm not kind of agreeing with e either of you, but I'm just saying that's really problematic for your average kind of citizen who's trying to maybe look at right. well, being a better citizen, like what, what do they actually do because they don't understand the intricacies of all the arguments on both well, sides. Exactly, exactly. It's like Brexit. Yeah, why why, why ask anyone what we should do about the EU? Or why ask anyone what we should do about energy policy? Because yeah, it's, a, it, it's like a really difficult. For a rainbow issue, yeah. right? Right. Why ask them? They shouldn't be allowed to make that decision. It should be government policy based on the best statistical evidence, evidence. and what's going to cut okay. CO2 the most. So and I instead we get selfish that. attitudes. But, you know, people. if you listen to the... Um, 
Philip Hammond's spring statement today in Parliament, you know, and, and his solution is to offset carbon, you know, which is like a really outdated fucking idea. He's, he's literally saying, well, yeah. we're going to make carbon, but we're going to have a big offset system so you can feel better about the bad stuff you do. Well, I mean, what the fuck? That's, that's 20 years out of date. And he's well, announced... It's a billion-dollar fraud, what? isn't it? It's huh? a billion-dollar fraud. It's yeah. a fraud. It's a scam. Yeah, yeah, it's a yeah. billion-dollar... It, it's... Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, bringing it back to individuals and mm. people and, like, God, what can we do? It's pretty obvious we're in a broken system with a lot of chaos. I mean, my number one thing to say is stop shopping. I mean, just stop shopping, everybody, because if you stop buying stuff, they'll stop making it. They'll stop shipping it around the world. The, you know, the factories won't be churning out pollution and everything to make pointless stuff. So... For me, it's like how you spend your money is actually the most one of the most powerful things that you can do because that that will that will determine what survives. Okay, I want to just jump in here. This is absolutely great. So can we delve into more about what people can do precisely with their waste, perhaps, Kat? And uh Sure. So I think probably the first thing to say is that. Everyone just needs to understand what the definition of waste is. The legal definition of waste is that you do discard something, you decide that you want to discard something, or you're legally forced to discard it in the case of, say, toxic or chemical waste. So waste isn't necessarily dirty or mouldy or grubby or, or, or useless. It's just something that you don't actually want to have in your possession anymore. And so based on that, as an individual, you just need to really like really audit your life, just one day audit your life on what comes into your life, what goes out of your life, you know, and just question, did I really need to consume that item? Is there a better version of it? Is there a different way that I can achieve um, the outcome without purchasing an item? So can you borrow it? Can you hire it? Um, you know, it's sort of that there's a lovely story about people that buy a drill because they want to put up shelves they don't actually need a drill they need a hole in their wall so to start thinking about you know how you get through your life and 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 then also to look at everything as a resource even if you're discarding it and so always kind of aiming high on where you want to get that discarded object to and you know actually in my world recycling is like the last option so you want to be looking at everything else above that and um I can only encourage people to um, uh, to ensure that their unwanted stuff gets reused. That's just a really, really simple way of um, substituting the need for other people to buy new stuff and keeping your stuff out of a waste stream where it gets managed, where it gets burnt or buried, you know, or reprocessed, which are really, really high carbon processes. So. Yeah, if everyone just became more conscious, really, of what comes into their life, what goes out of their life, and just trying to do better all the time, we'd um, we would shift, we would shift a whole lot of um, economic and and social models that exist now just by changing the way that we consume and what we consume and how we consume it. And would you have an idea of what's a good starting point, a starting place, some f a few little. Yeah, so probably um, there's different trigger points for everybody that's meaningful. So for some people, it might be fashion. Like you know, are you are you kind of just buying clothes pointlessly? I believe that uh, women's wardrobes in the Western world are three times bigger than they were in 1980. So we have a weird new normal. So yeah, maybe if you're sort of you know. Um, a, a young female, you know, that might be something you'd look at, like, do I really need to kind of buy all this clothing all the time or can I go to a clothes swap or should I just be buying stuff from charity shops? And, you know, for other people it might be about not buying the latest gadget and not upgrading your technology just for the heck of it. You know, do you really need to change the colour scheme in your kitchen? I mean, whatever your kind of lifestyle is, there's, there's stuff that you consume and just to – you know, for individuals just to think, like I said, audit your life, whoever you are, whatever you do, just kind of get up one day and make a note 
of everything that comes into your life and goes out of it. And there'll be something in there that you'll be easily able to reduce the, the impact you're having on the planet by changing a very small thing. Um, you know, I mean, a very simple thing for probably anybody is not buying water in single-use plastic bottles. Just don't do it, you know. Take a reusable bottle out with you if you must drink water constantly and download the refill app. And, you know, there's nearly a 1,000 venues around the UK that will refill your reusable water bottle for free. You know, you don't need to buy water in a plastic bottle. So there's a there's a huge variety of stuff you can do. I mean, use Freegal to give away your unwanted stuff. You know, don't borrow a car and go to the tip with your sofa or your your old DVDs or whatever. Like, make them available to someone else to keep using them. And I don't. And we talked about this in the first live stream that the waste is actually a really big emitter of CO two, which I don't think a lot of people realise. And especially supermarkets waste. I think that was number three or something. Yeah. No, waste is um a massive, massive uh emissions um in the built environment so that's construction and the management of the built environment in the uk is responsible for around between 50 and 60 percent of all goods and materials consumed in the uk it's responsible for 33 percent of all waste generated in the uk and it's responsible for 45 percent of all carbon emissions so for example that's why i worked with the university of brighton on building a house out of waste because if you change the way that we construct buildings and we change, um, uh, well, if we improve the insulation of those buildings so that they don't use so much energy when they're operating, you, you know, you can literally eliminate consumption, waste and carbon problems and, and reach targets we have by just changing the construction industry. And, um, you know, and, and that means that individuals don't have so much pressure on them to change individual behaviour because we should be renting and buying houses that are properly insulated that don't require us to spend thousands of pounds every year consuming gas and electricity just to heat them and cool them. So, I'd like to um, jump in now with a question, if I may. Um, um, I know that um, part of the reason Loic has been... Um, traveling in these incredible, inspiring ways is to change the mindset of people and promote um, people to think about living in a different way. And um, Kat, when I heard you speak about fashion, uh, it made me think that we need a, a kind of cultural shift in the way that we look at people wearing a new dress or something. Um, and um, Loic, I wonder if you could um, speak for a moment about how you're trying to shift people's uh, mindset about uh, transportation and what the best ways are to shift people's perspective. Can you unmute yourself as well because you're muted at the moment. <laughs> okay, I thought there was something wrong again. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, well, I, the, I truly think that uh, the most important thing to do if uh, you want to shift your mindset is to try to reconnect to earth, uh, to the ground. And that's what that's something I, I've learned mostly um, when I was working with uh, Inuit hunters. The, when you are in such a dangerous environment, and believe me, uh, Europe is more dangerous than the ice cap. Um, when you're in a dangerous environment, you need to be aware of everything you do and the impact of everything. Uh, everything you do has an impact on on Earth and on your environment. And I think uh, humankind needs to reconnect to Earth. Uh, and as soon as you do that, then you really realize that <laughs> first you should you should there is no waste for example uh in uh in in meat culture uh, because everything has a as a use so if you have to take a life for example if you earn to seal you get some food you get some clothes you get some warming oil uh, um and nothing is thrown away and uh it's a 
per permanent cycle and that's that's very important um i'm sorry english is very confusing for me <laughs> so i'm trying to be clear <laughs> you're but doing a great job like and it's really inspiring to hear you speak and i think um, what yeah I, to reimagine the future yeah what I think is that in everything we do, we need to understand that there is a strong impact on the planet. Even when we do in, use internet, for example, internet is a bigger polluter than China. It's, wow. It is because of the servers, because of all the energy required. And for the moment, we are not uh, uh, producing clean energy. We are trying, we are improving uh, the efficiency of uh, solar panels, of windmills, and uh, hydrogen is now coming in, in the game. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, did you understand what I just tried uh, to? Yeah, really. yeah. Uh, I've just got a quick question on that. Um, this is from one of the viewers, Flo. Uh, he's wondering, what is the current uh, progress with the hydrogen cell plane that you talked about? and what is the outlook for commercial electric planes? Do oh. you know anything about this? Yeah, well, first, uh, what I think is that we should not hope on having, for example, long haul flights with uh, clean techs uh, before at least 50 years. And I think right now the best way to have clean plane is uh, not taking the plane. Uh, the plane I'm working on right now is I'm working on uh, open innovation, meaning that there is no in, uh, industrial property on what I'm doing. What I want is this uh, technology to be available to anybody that's building an aircraft tomorrow uh, and that could put that uh, engine in his new aircraft. I don't know if that's clear again. We need solution and we need them fast. So if you want to really uh, have... Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, rupture? Um, if you really want to change the world, <laughs> you need to, to change basically the way we create um, things. And the, this project, for example, this plane that we are building has no meaning if it's a plane that shall enter the market tomorrow and be competitive with others and then we would try to be something like um uh, a company a big company uh, for building planes that makes no sense because this competition is making people lose time and we have no more time uh what i'm trying to say is that we need to create uh, solutions but we need to share them between individuals and groups and for the uh, common goods I, don't know. Yep. I think that's a really good point about collaboration yeah. Is the kind of linear capitalist model is all about competitiveness. You know, you're competing. There's like, there's got to be a winner. I mean, just look at Trump ment mentality. It's all about winners and losers. And that's not going to give us solutions. And I think, you know, what was just being said is that we all need to work together for the common good. And yeah, absolutely. And there is solutions. Values, you know, and. The, there and there's is a, one solution, there's a zillion solutions, and yeah, so it, there shouldn't be one winner, you know? Exactly, exactly. The very scary thing about this hydrogen plane we are building right now is that it's not complicated. Right now we are just playing with techni technological bricks that we need to assemble and put that in a plane. And it, it's, it's not like we would need to uh, invent atom. Uh, it's not rocket science. It's really. not difficult and it can be done from one day to another. It's that simple. And I don't understand that we are still working on uh, building planes with batteries or, or, or fossil fuel uh, energy while we have other solutions already. Uh, yeah. So for me, it's the same. I think it's actually quite simple. Like stop shopping, everybody. <laughs> stop buying new stuff. I'm sure if we never manufactured another coat hanger, another T-shirt, another coffee cup, I mean, I could name a gazillion, you know, products, we would be okay. We've already made enough of them. They already exist. So, yeah, it's actually quite simple, although it seems really overwhelming. There are some really simple things that individuals can do. Yeah. Uh, we've just got a question from the audience. Did you want to respond directly to that, Look. Uh, sure. What's the question? Uh, I wasn't sure if I was interrupting you. 
Can I speak? Yeah. Okay, so um, Kat, there's a question from the audience. Um, uh, just about uh, composting. Um, just looking for some any tips that you might have on uh, personal composting at home or industrial composting. Okay, um, for people that's a who really good question because um, we are still part of the EU, maybe for not very longer, who knows. But right now, uh, on any packaging or product in the UK where you see the word compostable, what that actually means by law under EU regulation is that that material or product is industrially compostable. It does not mean that you can compost it at home. And um, that's just a real red flag for everybody to be aware of. Um, if a material or a product can actually be composted at home or if it accidentally ends up in the environment, um, they will say that very, very, very clearly um, because it's a very rare thing. So. Um, it's a really good question to ask because when people are trying to address the problem of single-use plastic and take away coffee cups and things like that, they're often uh, instantly saying, well, well, the alternative and the solution is compostables. Well, that's not true because we don't have the infrastructure to capture all these compostables. Um, so just to make everybody aware of that, so the actual issue is disposability versus reusability. So we actually need to, um, if we're going to have disposable items, then they need to just be a very limited number of materials and then we have to have major harmonic infrastructure across any na uh, nation or region to capture those materials. But the best thing is to actually try to eliminate disposability um, I mean, that was just a, kind of a 1950s thing where they were really trying to, uh, uh, the, the plastics industry actually lobbied and got permission from the American government to produce a whole bunch of disposable objects like disposable cutlery. It just did not exist uh, before the early 60s. And that was just their business model to keep making money. And so actually we just need to kind of try to avoid disposable items and return to having reusable objects in our life, whether that be a razor, a straw, a cup, a bag, you know, a glass or whatever. So, um, and in terms of food composting, um, I think we will find in the UK there's a consultation out now by the government um, around this very issue, and I'm pretty sure that the government is going to um say that every single uh, council in the uk must provide food waste composting service for the citizens i think this will come in in the next year or two um a lot of uh towns and cities already have it the entire nation of wales has uh curbside food waste collection um but it's problematic for places like brighton and hove where we don't have the uh the money or the uh the funding to put it in place but i think uh, anyway that is going to happen very shortly um in the meantime there are lots of uh community uh, solutions to this so if people google community composting they will more than likely find if you're in a in a reasonably large urban population area in the uk that there are actually community composting options so you can take your potato peels and your leftover scrap food um, to composting bins that are located throughout the community but because we're not uh, selling a product we don't have marketing or PR or TV ads or big promotion of these things a lot of solutions already exist in communities uh, to be more resourceful and less wasteful but people just don't know about them so my handy hint would be if you kind of want to do something like that wherever you live, like just dig down a bit and do some online research and you might find that there is a solution in your local area, but you just don't happen to know about it. Amazing. Thank you very much for that, Kat. Cool. I just, that's uh, some great stuff that uh, after, at the end of this, we'll, we'll try and summarize it and post out the important links because you mentioned a lot there. At this point, I just want to bring in Sean. Um, I want, I'd like to see if you've got any solutions for people out there, simple things that people do day to day to perhaps cut down on the CO2 emissions 
or or perhaps even live off grid like yourself if if you think that is a good thing in terms of I environment i pers like i live on a barge and it is not that green like like actually this this concept of living in the country is like oh i'm green i've got a vegetable garden in the country your actual support services the getting the electricity and everything is not green it's like i've got solar panels that's not really green it because i'm sitting here in the dark freezing my tits off going out getting skip wood and burning that and it's the, the smoke from that is just terrible it's just like i feel so guilty about that and if i if i was on grid with clean electricity from a fucking nuclear power station all well and good but the actual the, this off-grid living i think you, your actual energy to get the, the, those things that the wind turbines your solar panels you do use less power obviously because you're sitting there in the dark with an led light on and the, these it's green because they're broken you know so um but i do agree it's it, a cut down on your waste and everything but at the same time that there's a there's a huge sort of impetus for guilt so you know people post pictures about the pollution in the sea and how we've got to stop using one use bottles in london in, in Europe and how this is polluting the planet and it's getting eaten by the fish and everything. In actual fact, if you look at a map of pollution, it's not the, it's not the people who are concerned about pollution who are polluting the planet. It's actually the people who aren't concerned. And this is, this is not me being caught. The reason it's never said is because people are politically correct and they don't want to appear culturally superior, but it's countries like China, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam that pollute the seas with plastics. You look at that, that river of refuse flowing out into the sea. That's from Haiti. Yeah, I've got to interject it's, here. The thing is, guilt. is those countries don't have waste management systems. 30 exactly. years ago, those countries did not have those materials or products yeah. in their environment. The Western world has gone into those countries and sold them our shit, but without. Uh, hang on, any, hang on. That, that, they made a choice. They made a choice. Banana leaves or a plastic plate. They've chosen a plastic plate, right? You cannot then say to them, "Sorry, we fucked up the planet. You cannot have a plastic plate anymore," right? And we, that's just we morally wrong. With, we went in with products, but we didn't go in with a closed loop solution for them to be able to manage those products during we didn't have a closed loop solution then did we it's only now only now do we have this vision and now it's like oh we're blaming ourselves because we can't blame them not really well, actually, what I we mean, should do the instead of, of cradle to cradle and the circular economy has been around since the 1980s but you know nobody's chosen to adopt that as a model, I mean, I think the West has a lot to answer for, for all that pollution that's being churned out of Asia and developing nations. We have foisted those products and materials on those economies, but we have not foisted the management systems on those on those societies. I mean, we do have a big responsibility. Actually, corporations have gone in and made money from selling those products to those developing nations, and they have not put in the infrastructure to manage the waste. We those, have those, those countries don't have the finances to recycle, collect it for them. They're looking at it is the rubbish truck coming? No, let's throw it in the river, right? We don't want to blame them for the refuse in the oceans, right? Because we're culturally superior as we think so we're not going to say anything about it i think yeah if we want to sort it out put some money into that it's like idiots in britain putting solar panels on their roofs when there's sod all sunlight you could take those solar panels and put them in africa on african school kids on in africa and they would have six hours of sunlight three times as much as us that would cut co2 emissions threefold instead we're like oh we're gonna put a solar panel on the roof send None the fucker that. to africa you know what we Use it as aid. it's like us being blaming ourselves for something and then we fuck it up because we can't look at it logically Cat, what you, I, just, I just want to how much bring, would it cost 
I just want to bring to sort out refuse collection in a third world country. Fuck all, because you pay them 10p an hour. Right? <laughs> the amount of money we spend in Britain sorting out waste, we could probably sort out the entire waste problem around the world. I think, I think this is a, a, a good point. Um, Mike, I'm going to bring you in here at, at this point. You... No, please don't. I'm new to... <laughs> <laughs> No, just kidding. Uh, quite interesting. Uh, the the thing is, uh, the, all this uh, story about that story, but the guilt, you know, guilt. Who cares? Uh, I work with a lot of uh, children, for example, and most of them they are between six and ten in school, and they are all they all feel guilty. They they feel like there is an emergency to solve the issues of the world, and they feel guilty because they forgot to turn off the light and because they. Uh, the, the 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 guilt is not the problem now now we need solutions i i don't really care anymore about uh, um is it the fault of the choices of my grandfather or is it the fault of uh, young inuits that are not caring about their environment because they feel like it's uh it's um they can throw that bottle, that plastic bottle, uh, on the ice cap because nobody will see that. The, now, what we need to do is collectively to bring solutions forward. That uh, idea of bringing uh, solar panels from London to Africa is quite interesting, and for sure it will be more efficient. The problem is that uh, in Africa there is a lot of, uh, uh, of issues when you want to bring solutions uh, because there is political corruption because um, and so so <laughs> I just think we really need to to rethink the way we are producing the way we are consuming and that's for sure you you absolutely right Kat we we are um, consuming a lot of stuff that we absolutely don't need and uh this all this stuff is putting some weight in our lives and it's making us heavier we cannot go forward uh, uh it's not really clear in english once again um uh, it's kind of in i i know what you're saying it's like Thank you. yeah there's just too much stuff in the world and so much stuff that we consume doesn't even have a point we don't even need it yeah, it has no meaning. Plus, we have no need for it, and it, it doesn't make us happy. It has no function. Actually, actually, it does make us happy because what you own is produ producing some uh, pleasure hormones in your brain, and it makes you feel safer. But the truth is that oh, it, it's, it's not making you safer, though, right? Because actually, you end up having to clean stuff, organize it, sort it, find it, uh, manage it. So the positive that you get from consuming new stuff is actually very, very short-lived, which I would suggest is why people keep buying new stuff because the satisfaction they get from it does not last and actually a burden. So maybe we need to be kind of talk about that a bit more, you know, yeah. to be real. Can I, can I interject one point here? If, if, if people stop buying stuff, right then they have excess income and the one place that excess income goes into is housing prices because like you think oh fuck it i've got an extra 20 grand let's get a hun an extra hundred thousand on the mortgage and because there's limited housing stock all that happens is house prices go up so i mean i'm not saying one sh yeah my girlfriend linda from latvia and she she just says in latvia they only have one fridge one type of washing machine if it breaks they fix it so it's definitely, and she says it's a very happy society. It's, it's the, you are totally right. We don't need all this shit. But there are other factors involved in cutting down on having the shit because no, lots no, of people I, will lose, lots of people will lose their jobs. The whole capitalist no, economy I know, collapses I know, and you I mean, basically die. I mean, I say all this stuff as a poor person, right? So yeah, it's, I'm not poor like as well. I'm, it's not like I'm protected from the impact of kind of, the consequences of what I'm suggesting. But, like, that's the kind of shift that we need. You know, that is the kind of shift that we need and all this nonsense over high streets and how we can keep them alive and stuff. And, 
I mean, man, get get rid of pound shops, get rid of cheap stuff. If something's cheap, somebody or something is being exploited somewhere. Nothing should be That's, cheap. Yeah. yeah. Then, then what about chickens, for instance? Like, so should you be allowed to buy a four pound chicken that's battery raised in Lidl or should people be limited in what they can purchase and they shouldn't be allowed a battery chicken that's been brought up in an inhumane environment and they should be made to eat organic at 16 pounds? You know, you, you're moving into territories of... I, I know it's a really awkward, a really awkward area and that's why I kind of qualified it by saying I am a poor person. So it's not like I'm immune to... Yeah. The impacts of what I'm saying, but actually, maybe that wouldn't be such a bad thing. Maybe it should be a very special, very reverential experience to eat a chicken. Maybe it shouldn't be something that we expect to be able to do seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. You know, maybe that's part of the problem is that we just want all these really indulgent kind of um, excesses in our life 24-7, maybe we need to, like, pull our head in a bit. You know, maybe some things should be special and they do cost more money and therefore they don't happen all the time but you respect them more and they mean more. Maybe that's a shift. It's a value shift, you know. Actually, the, I think the shift is to quality. Uh, disposable plastic... Uh, things that you pay you buy for 10 cents and just throw away a second after and just forget about it i had uh, my my grandfather was looking at me when i was young and he was looking at my sneakers and telling me oh boy i don't have the the money to dress like you do and that man was always into a very very beautiful italian suit with uh, leather shoes but he was changing of shoes and of suit. Uh, I mean, buying a new one every five years because he was buying high quality and made uh, material. And uh, so there is an economy into this. So not buying shit doesn't mean that there will be no more job for anybody. No, that's right. And, you know... It's just it's, buying and consuming different. Yeah, it's, that's right. And, you know, if there's wealthy people that that buy high quality things and then they replace those, they can pass those things on to other people. You know, I'd much rather buy something. I can get much higher quality goods by procuring them secondhand and yeah. therefore I don't need to procure cheap things new because you can actually get for less money better things secondhand. There's an entire economy and market there which has a lot of potential. Okay, I'm just going uh, to jump in here. So, so absolutely great stuff. Uh, a few of the viewers uh, are talking about the fact that we need to, to starve the capitalist system and we need to drive change via that way. Uh, so some very interesting ideas in the chat if people would like to read that. Um, so we've only got five minutes left. So we've got two last things we're going to go through very quickly. The first thing I'm going to ask each of you speakers to say one or two things that people can do after watching this. One or just one or two things. And then after that, we're gonna uh, look at a few things that you, you, you'd you all like to plug. So uh, one of you, please say one or two things. I'm gonna start with Kat, actually. Stop shopping. <laughs> just stop buying new stuff and choose to reuse. That's just my number one then just stop buying new stuff. Perfect. Loic or Sean? Who's ready? Um, Loic. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, one, one thing you can... There is plenty of things you can do. First thing you can be, and uh, this is not religion, but be try to eat uh, as little meat as you can in your life because this has a huge impact on the planet. I, I'm not saying that it's evil to have meat, but if you just have 100 grams of meat every week, for example, uh, if every human being would have 100 grams of meat every week, the, we would have 20% uh, less... Uh, uh, carbon. Thank you. Ca carbon in the air. So that's one-fifth of the problem. 
That's, that's a really amazing, that's a really that's excellent great. suggestion. We can yeah, all right. do that. It's easy. 100 Second. grams, haven't we? Yeah. That's what we need to aim for. I'm yeah. going to try and do that. I've been trying and to cut actually, it down. Actually, our grandparents, they had less than that before World War II. Yes. And uh, the second thing is do not take the plane. <laughs> Yay, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love planes, but uh, it's a disaster. It's Jump on the train. You can have the healthiest way of life, I mean, the greenest way of life, and you then just take a plane to go from London to New York City, for example, for one week vacation. And I love vacation, but uh, the, then the, 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 your global um, impact. impact yearly impact goes uh, boom so uh that that's very little things then you can also recycle reuse uh buy cool stuff save the money you spend on, on bullshit and and use it to buy something of high quality yes uh, so le less but better and uh, i think the the most important thing is just do not give up uh, because we need to spread hope around and uh, when when you're sick like I am, or when you're on the ice cap, or when you are into an emergency situation, giving up means dying. And for Earth, that's what is uh, in front of us. So we need to collaborate, we need to work together, we need to share ideas, we need to forget about pro intellectual and uh, property and ownership. Share car, share your car, share your bike, share your skateboard. Uh, share your clothes if you can, it's whatever fun. you can share, share it and um, and go ahead. Oh, great stuff! That's very oh. cool. And Sean, have you got a minute? Yeah, I, I, got one minute. I totally agree with all of that. Eat, spend basically spend less. Don't take the don't take any planes. Um, there, there's a touch. Um, the, the seven year olds living in fear angle. Um, there, there used to be this theory that the government wants us to be scared so it can control us, so it makes these imaginary enemies. These Possibly these imaginary enemies no longer exist because it's like there's ISIS or whatever, but they're fucking thousands of miles away and they're bombed to shit by everyone. So uh, the enemies we have are, are, are sort of disappearing. So now we have a new enemy uh, and it, it's climate change, it's global warming and... If you, if you, my my actual laptop's just turned off, but if you actually read the climate extinction thing, it's like the the, the headline sort of we're going to die. The government's misleading you. We need everything we can to survive. It, it's not really true because there's lots of if you look at news, that like the world is a greener place. There's that that NASA survey and. The, the headline is like, oh, China and India are making the world greener by planting more trees. And then in the subtext, in the Nature article, it says because of global warming, of climate change, the actual increase in CO2 levels yeah. and the increase in temperature has made those parts of the world greener. You, the, we, we, we're being made to be terrified of stuff and people's lives are being ruined with yeah. fear. No, you know, and my kids are like, oh, daddy, are we going to die? Right? And I'm like, well, fuck, no, you're not. You know, it's like you, you temperatures in by five degrees. The whole of the northern hemisphere ha has a, a growing season of 16 hours in the summer. So, yeah, the world is, I think the world's going to end. It's changing. And the real crying shame is the oceans with a lot of fish and biodiversity. But actually, as far as humanity goes, child mortality rates around the world have halved over every 10 years. So there's no actual evidence of this catastrophe that's going to happen to mankind. It's the absolute opposite. But, I, but we're all made to fear it for, for what? Some fucking company who's selling you solar panels. Well, I, th I, th like I, I, just, want to, I just want to inject here, but I think it's, it's a growing problem that we're not going to, we're not seeing the full effects of yet, but in 15, 20 years, we really well, right, and you're very lucky because you live on a barge, and when the sea, <laughs> the sea level rises quite considerably, that's you, going to mess up a lot of people's lives. Yeah, well, I can what tell you're you saying, that what you're, the effects you're seeing are the increase in energy costs due to renewable fuels, and that's what's fucking the economy. That's why people are poor is because of energy cost increase. Yeah, because true. of renewables. 
And that's going to fucking that's really kill it. because our house enough. is uninsulated properly. So you could fix mm. all of that in one fell sure. swoop by having a government program that just mandates that every living place in the UK has to be insulated properly. So there's another way of kind of readdressing that. But I do agree with you that, like, there's a lot of doom and gloom, and which is why it's really important to for like what's going on here tonight because there are real solutions and really easy things that citizens anybody can do to reduce their impact on the planet and and to have a nice life at the same time you know it shouldn't be about not having a nice life it's just a different way of going about having that that okayness you know great i, I just want to inject here so uh we are we we are over time now so have either of you, uh, each one of you got some plugs, something that you, you would like to bring awareness to, some projects or things you're working on? Okay, so I'll go first. So just if you're in the UK, there are 450 reused communities around the UK. I love Freegal.org. It's the simplest thing in the world. You just go on there. And if you've got something in your house, in your life, you don't want any more, whether it's working, it's not working, it's good, it's not good, just offer it on your local Freegal group because every Freegal community has different people on there. There are people on there that can fix things, repair things, upcycle them, reuse them, whatever. And it's just a free, easy thing that anybody can do and you can just stop sending so much stuff to landfill and incineration. Ba-boom. Nice. Loic, have you got any plugs? Polar kit, etc. Uh plugs as uh, something you'd like to promote, something oh. <laughs> uh that you're working on. Uh yeah, uh, actually I work on a lot of things these days, so um but basically uh I don't want to preach for, for my own church. I just think that everybody out there that we are reaching right now through this wonderful podcast uh, should just uh, get interest in his neighbor and you you will find a, find a lot of uh, clubs clubs and initiatives where you can uh, uh, what's the word uh, go uh, um, simplicate implicate yourself do you say that um, <clears throat> make you make yourself useful yeah you can make yourself useful in a lot of means, uh, um, go for that. You can look for life for DC, what, what we are doing here. But I think that um, have a global, uh, have a local uh, impact, work with people around you as much as you can. And uh, yeah, I would more go with that. I don't know if that's clear. <laughs> Sorry. Mm -hmm. Nice, can I chuck in a couple? Um, like, I don't know if you would count, uh, Kat, in your um, 450 reuse communities, I think you said, in the UK. That's loads. Um, I don't know if they would technically qualify as those, but I think stuff like couch surfing, where you actually meet human beings and stay in their homes instead of booking a boring hotel on your own when you go traveling somewhere. It's just a beautiful way to meet people and and connect meaningfully and, and you know it just ultimately means less money going into the hotel industry and um i'd rather that space be used for parks and other cooler stuff and similarly with lift share or blah blah car just ways to get um more bums in seats on cars and less empty or nearly empty cars on the roads like cars are almost always like if you look at cars as just a bunch of seats the vast majority of those seats are empty like 99 percent of the time it's ridiculous how we use cars in the Western world. Um, so yeah, just sharing stuff I think is, is beautiful. And Fat Llama is another app for if you can't find stuff for free or borrowing, then you can hire it. Um, I think they're all pretty neat. Um, and then I would just say also, I don't know if Sean would agree, but Extinction Rebellion is an amazing movement I find really exciting. And even if you only join it for the third demand, which is um, community engagement, sort of citizen assemblies, um, that is an amazing way to radically transform democracy and give more people a voice in how to shape their local communities. And it is so exciting. I'd love more people to understand that demand of Extinction Rebellion. Yay. Thank you guys for hosting this. It's been awesome. Oh, and, and Sean, have you have you got a plug? Yeah. Eat, 
Um, it's an alternative to Extinction Rebellion. It's it's um, something called <laughs> eco modernism. Eco modernism It's basically like how man can have rewild the countryside just by using nuclear power, vertical inner city farms, and LED lighting. And it's it's an optimistic way of looking at stuff rather like than that. the world is ending. I'm going to check that out. Yeah, I like that. Eco modernism, nuclear power. Cool. Right, cool. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to leave on an optimistic note that we've only got 12 years left to save the planet. So, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Let's let's Bye. get stuff happening. All right. Bye. 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 Second Wednesday Thanks, of everyone. every month. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Thanks a lot. All right, chaps. I'll stop broadcast. Speaker, speaker in a say, second. Ah, oh, this cat's gone. <laughs> um, can, can, can we try and? Uh, does someone want to try and get cat back on, just in case? <laughs> I'm going to stop broadcast now and we can carry on chatting in deep. Oh, it's still live. <laughs> Stopping in three. <laughs> oh. I'm going to stop now.